This video is about a fallacy that's committed pretty commonly, the argument from incredulity, but which is not all that often discussed in critical thinking textbooks. It's often lumped under you know, rhetorical techniques, not looked at as a fallacy, but it really is a fallacy because it is an argument. So here we're gonna do eight things. We're gonna look at what this argument from incredulity is. We'll examine the argument structure of the fallacy. We'll talk about what goes wrong with the reasoning, why it's a fallacy. Then we'll examine some common situations where you should be on your guard. We'll look at three examples of the fallacy, and we'll talk about how you can spot it. What are the red flags to look for? For you students out there, we'll talk about what it gets mistaken for, and we'll finish up by talking about how you can avoid falling into this fallacy in your own thinking, your own reasoning, and your own communication with other people. So what is this fallacy of argument from incredulity? Um, sometimes it's called an appeal to common sense. I've seen people call it lack of imagination. I actually propose a little tongue-in-cheek, the fallacy of the lowest common denominator. And what it is at its core is saying that a claim can be dismissed as being possible or being true on the basis of it being inconceivable or hard to imagine or difficult to believe or difficult to understand. Um, essentially you say, because I find this, this hard to accept, it must be unacceptable. So why is it called the fallacy from incredulity? Incredulity is the sort of emotion of, you gotta be kidding me, you know? Um, so how does this, this, this fallacy work? Let's look at the structure. Somebody will say, I find X difficult to believe or imagine or understand. And then they go to the conclusion that X is false. Or sometimes they'll even say, X doesn't make any sense at all. It's unintelligible. And there's a couple premises that are being you know, used, but they're implicit here. And if you made them explicit, you would see very quickly that this is a bad argument. So here's one of the premises. When a claim is difficult for me to understand, believe, imagine, etc., it cannot be true or understandable or whatever. Uh, the other premise, very similar, my capacities for imagination, understanding, and thinking are roughly the same as the, the audience's. You say this to other people and you're like, that can't possibly be the case because you expect that the audience is also going to say, yeah, you're right, that, can't, that doesn't make any sense. So if you take these and you put them, if you, you know, expose them to the best disinfectant, which is sunlight, if you make implicit premises explicit, you see what's actually wrong here. Is it the case that when something is difficult for me to understand or to believe that it can't possibly be true? Yeah, if I'm God, if, if I'm like the norm for what could possibly be the case, but uh, haven't met anybody like that yet. So another way of looking at this structure is that the, the, this person A is, is sort of like taking the mantle of speaking for everyone. And they're saying, I just can't accept claim X. So therefore, claim X must be wrong. It, it, you know, we should reject it. What's wrong here? So like I just put it out, it assumes that the criterion for whether a claim can be imagined or understood or accepted or determined to be true is whether a given person is able to believe or understand or imagine that claim. Now, there could be some people who actually are a criterion for that. Um, you know, medical practice, your doctor, your, your nurse, your nurse practitioner, they've had some training. Um, if you go to them and you say, I think I've got polio, and they say, you don't have polio. There's no way you've got polio. That's not an argument from incredulity. That's an expert actually saying, look, given what we know about medical uh, matters, that's not really a possibility for you. But if you just go to Joe on the street and you say, I think I got polio. And he says, I can't imagine that you have polio. You know, and then you say, do you even know what polio is? I don't need to know what polio is. Well, then you probably have an argument from incredulity there. Um, Here's something to keep in mind. Many people are not in a particularly well-situated position to be able to understand, let alone evaluate many claims. 
Uh, it's a sad but true fact. Um, people often think that they're smarter than they are. They, they did some really interesting studies and they found out that if we divide people into quartiles, um, you know, when it comes to like, you know, um, self-evaluation, people in the top 75 percent, the people who are, you know, you know, the top 25 percent, the people who are really good, the middle 50 percent, they often have a fairly decent understanding of how well they understand things. People in the bottom 25 percent often think they're a lot smarter than they are. Um, another problem with this line of thinking is it assumes that the audience is just as badly equipped to understand or evaluate the claim. So because I find something difficult to buy, you should equally find it difficult to buy. And that may not be the case. We also know from experience there have been a lot of claims that have been rejected on this sort of basis, and then they actually turned out to be true. So we should, you know, we should be a little skeptical of this kind of thing. So when do people use this, this sort of argument? Like I put here, it's often done when complex matters are being discussed uh, or when, com when you know, counterintuitive or paradoxical claims are being advanced, uh, especially when one of the parties would like to, as we say, level the playing field that is to disregard expertise. So, you know, there's a lot of things that are hard to wrap our heads around unless we've had some, some practice or some training or some, some we've got some information. Um, and without that, we may not be equipped to, to make judgments. Um, this gets used in context ranging from politics and policy making. You see it all the time in politics and policy making on both sides of the aisle. Economics and finance, a lot of people assume that if they, if they don't understand something, that there must be something wrong with it. Um, some things, you know, are actually hard to understand, and there are things wrong with it. Um, some of these, you know, financial uh, mechanisms that, that they engage in. But you got, you know, if you you have to have some training to be able to make that. Personal relationships. I can't possibly imagine that so and so would do X, Y, or Z. Maybe they will though. Uh, it's used in theist, uh, atheist apologetics and polemics. Um, it even gets used in aesthetics, art, and design. I don't, I don't know how you can possibly listen to that, or you know, what could you possibly be be seeing in that artwork over there? Um, well, that, that could be the argument from incredulity. Let's look at some examples. Now, the movie Princess Bride has a great example of this, and it's a really famous line that um, Mandy Patinkin's uh, character. Inigo Montoya gets to say, you keep using that word, I do not think it means what you think it means. That's been turned into a meme. Now, why did that come up? There's a scene where the, uh, the hero, the, who, you know, turns out to be, he starts out as a pirate and then he turns out to be this, this good guy. He's climbing up a rope and uh, Vizzini has them cut the rope and the pirate doesn't fall. And Vizzini says, he didn't fall? inconceivable and he keeps on saying inconceivable 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 so Inigo Montoya <coughs> says you know you keep using that word I don't think you know what it know what it actually means why because if something truly is inconceivable that means that we cannot think of it so can you think about somebody cutting a rope uh, and the other the person who's on the rope grabbing onto something and not falling that's not inconceivable um, but Vizzini is like saying well this can't be you know, this must not be the case because I can't conceive of it. Reporters do this all the time with the word unimaginable. If it's unimaginable, then you can't imagine it, which means that you have no way of telling us whether you can or can't imagine it. You know, saying uh, you, their grief is unimaginable. Really? I can imagine it, so it's not unimaginable. Um, but that's an argument from incredulity. Example two. I call this one a sucker born every minute after P.T. Barnum's famous line, right? There's a sucker born every minute. And it goes like this. Jimmy is such a nice guy. He's thoughtful. He's considerate. He sure seems to know a lot about managing and making money. I can't possibly imagine he could steer me towards a bad investment. Now, is that a good reason why I should invest all my savings with Jimmy? Probably not. You want to have some independent corroboration of that sort of thing. 
Uh, but people are taken advantage of all the time under under conditions like that. Um, they say, I can't imagine that somebody would do something bad. Therefore, they, they won't do something bad. And then it turns out that they do do something bad. Uh, people can also do this with uh, bad people. I can't imagine that somebody who, you know, uh, people do this with prisoners, right? I used to teach at a maximum security prison. And I would see people on the outside saying, you know, I can't imagine that somebody who was a contract killer could ever be rehabilitated. Uh, well, you know, because you can't imagine it doesn't mean that it's not the case. Things, things happen that are beyond the realm of your experience or your conception. Here's a particularly bad argument for God's existence. Um, and this is one that, that atheist uh, polemicists, you know, diagnose in, in some theists, and they're right to diagnose this. When I look at the night sky in this beautiful, complicated world, I just can't see how all of this could have arisen from chance. That just doesn't make any sense. You get what I'm saying? Therefore, God exists. Now, I'm not saying that we should therefore reject all design arguments because they often are much better than, than this. But if, it's, if this is what somebody's saying, this is not a good argument for the existence of God. Um, I just can't imagine that, you know, God didn't make all of this sort of stuff. Uh, that's, that's probably a failure of your own imagination then, right? Um, you could read some books and maybe get some ideas, go to some lectures, you know, watch some videos. Then you might get some better ideas. Um, again, I'm not saying that uh, we should therefore throw out all arguments for God's existence uh, or view this as, you know, the representative design arguments. That would be a straw man fallacy right there. Um, but, you know, this is, this is a good example. How do you spot this fallacy? So one of the first things I would say is be on guard for a certain kind of people. People who, without any good reason, view their own capacities for understanding or conceiving or imagining or judging or believing as normative for everybody else. Now, the reason why I have without any good reason, a doctor should in fact think that, the, that he, has, he or she has better medical knowledge than somebody else. A friend of mine is an emergency vet. Um, you know, when my dog is sick, I'm going to call her up and, um, you know, have her walk me through stuff because she's an actual expert. If I can get a hold of her, you know. Um, a favor if, if she does that sharing expertise uh, but there's a lot of people who don't have any good reason to think that they provide the norm you know and, and very few people have any reason to think they provide the norm across the board um, another thing you can do see whether a person actually has reasons other than their own inability to understand or imagine or believe a claim to make judgments about the status of the claim when you see people saying I can't imagine that's the case. That, that just doesn't make sense. See whether they have anything else going on. If, if they do, then maybe they're not just falling into that, that fallacy. Maybe they have some other reason you should listen to them. If they don't, then it's probably the argument from incredulity. What's not the fallacy of argument from incredulity? So there's a couple different other fallacies that are easily mixed up with this. One of them is what we call the argument from conversion. And the way that this one runs is it says, well, I used to think X, but now I think Y because I've learned better. And so therefore X is, is false. Um, that's not the argument from incredulity because you're saying, you're not just saying, look, I can't picture X being correct. Um, X, you know, makes my, my head hurt. You're saying, no, I actually did believe X before and now I see what, it's wrong. Arguments that just say that a lot of other people believe the same thing that one does and therefore would reject a claim are not the argument from incredulity. They're actually just the appeal to popularity, one that we, we see uh, quite often being made. Uh, another one that sometimes get mixed up with the argument from incredulity uh, is the argument from ignorance that just shifts the burden of proof and says, because you haven't proven X to be the case, not X is definitely the case. Um, that's not the same thing as the argument from incredulity, but it is, I can see why it looks similar. 
Now, not every argument which points out that a claim is unlikely to be true or difficult to accept is a fallacious argument. Like I pointed out, when an expert says, no, nah, you're, you're probably wrong about that, that's not an argument from incredulity. And there's probably some things where even if you're not an expert, we can say that's probably not the case, right? And so you don't want to diagnose that as, as a fallacy when it's not the case. How do you avoid falling into this fallacy yourself? So, you know, the biggest thing is to avoid this common temptation that's part of our human nature to think that our horizons are the horizons of the universe. That because I can't conceive of something, it, it's inconceivable. Um, you know, making our own perspective, our understanding, or our common sense, um, or our feelings. Even, you know, feelings are a really bad guide for this. We shouldn't make that into a criterion for everybody else's possible understanding or imagination or conception. Um, just because you think something is that way doesn't mean that everybody has to view it that way. Um, also, when rejecting a claim, see if you can find better criteria. You know, if you want to say, look, this doesn't make sense to me, figure out why it doesn't make sense to you. It could be because you just haven't researched it enough or you're, you're poorly informed or you've got some emotional block. It could be because there actually is something, you know, screwy about it. And then you should be able to find something that somebody else can say, yeah, you're, you're right. This is something we should reject. So last thing I want to say, this video is part of a whole series discussing common fallacies, and it belongs to a channel devoted to critical thinking, logic, and argumentation. So if you like this video, if you found this useful for improving your own critical thinking skills, share it with other people and come back to the channel. I'll be uploading more and more content over time. So check in and uh, check out some of the other videos that we've got here.